Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 70 of Ask the CEO with Avraham Gatile. Today, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. He's the principal manufacturing industry lead on the Microsoft Azure Industry Experiences team, where he focuses on ensuring that Azure delivers the best cloud platform for manufacturing customers and sharing Microsoft's cloud story with decision makers and influencers. Prior to joining Microsoft, he worked as the manufacturing industry strategist for Autodesk, where he helped define the vision for Autodesk in manufacturing and was an evangelist of Autodesk thought leadership in the industry by delivering talks, writing, and engaging with the media and industry analysts. He defines himself as a student of the manufacturing industry whose passion is to follow what's going on in design and manufacturing, identify technical and business forces and trends, forecast where the industry is going, and help Microsoft build the best cloud platform to empower designers and engineers to achieve more. It is my pleasure to welcome the one and only Diego Tamburini. Welcome, Diego. Thank you very much, Avraham, for having me in your show, and thanks to your audience for spending the time to listen to this podcast. Thank you so much for joining. So, Diego, what are some of the ways today's technology, such as IoT, artificial intelligence, machine learning, et cetera, is impacting businesses in the manufacturing industry? And how is Microsoft making a difference in the marketplace? Possibly the, the main way technology is impacting business in, in the manufacturing industry is in the way that data is being used to inform decisions. Increasingly, manufacturing is becoming a, a data-driven industry. So more and more uh, machines and assets and products are getting connected to the internet, uh, the internet of things, uh, and to each other. So they are sending data on their health, on their operation, on their environment. And this is information that when harnessed properly, can give you the ammunition to make better and informed decisions. So manufacturers are going through a journey that starts with connecting their products to the IoT, and then being able to answer the question, what's happening by looking at sensor data of their machines and services, then progressing into being able to answer the question, why is happening by leveraging data analytics to the more sophisticated stage where they can answer questions like what will happen uh, using AI and machine learning to predict what will happen based on historical data to the ultimate level where you have autonomous responses to, to improve or correct something. So to the question of, on how is Microsoft making a difference in the marketplace, Microsoft has the, the best industry ready and enterprise ready cloud platform for software developers who want to develop industry solutions on top of it. So we go beyond providing the, the necessary uh, generic plumbing uh, for any cloud applications such as uh, messaging or storage or uh, security. And in our cloud platform, we have capabilities that are particularly important to manufacturing, such as IoT, machine learning, time series analytics, enterprise application integration, etc. Now, what specifically, what kind of uh, problems have you seen out there in manufacturing that uh, you've been a part of? Yeah, but basically, the, the, the problems... <laughs> You, you can argue that any manufacturing company has always had the, the same goal forever, right? Which is increase efficiency. I mean, they basically want to either, either increase the top line by getting more revenue or decrease the bottom line by uh, uh, increase expenses. increasing cost. And yeah. so, so that still applies, right? The, 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 and the technologies and the ways that people do that have changed over the ages, right? I mean, today uh, uh, we are in the proverbial fourth uh, uh, industry revolution, which is all about connecting uh, 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 machines and, and, and assets and products, like I say, to the internet or to each other, generating huge amounts of data. So, so that's, the, that, that's the, where we are now. And the problems that that 
the, no problems, but challenges that it is creating is, okay, I have all this data, now what, right? H how do I tie that to a, to, to a business goal, such as uh, uh, improving machine utilization or generating a new source of revenue, which is after all, that's what you're, uh, you're going after. I mean, you're not collecting data for the sake of collecting data. So, so that's where we are now, that we are well into the fourth industry revolution stage. Uh, machines are connecting and are happily sending terabytes of data into storage. And our people are asking, okay, what can I do with this data? What should I do with this data? How do I get a competitive advantage? You know, you've hit a, upon uh, several good points there. I mean, all of them were good points. Uh, but <laughs> um, one of them that I, I really like what you said was the autonomous response, because nowadays people are struggling to do more with less. Uh, everybody is trying to become more competitive. They're trying to, like you said, increase the top line, decrease the expenses. So when thinking about things like autonomous responses, so you've got all these automated um, factories where uh, there's so many different moving parts. And uh, as you know, machines break. Um, and that's where the predictive analytics come in. So imagine a situation where um, a motor is about to die rather than somebody finding out about it after the fact, right. it will not only inform you, but maybe even order the part for you. So when the manager comes in, there's a nice box from Amazon or wherever waiting at his desk. And all they have to do is uh, schedule maintenance. Right. Right. And, and that's exactly right. I mean, that, that is a perfect example of how, uh, the IoT and smart manufacturing uh, can really impact you, your bottom line, right? I mean, in a, imagine that the part that you just described or the equipment that you just described is a, is a high value piece of equipment, either because it's big and expensive and heavy or because uh, having downtime, particularly unplanned downtime, is very, very costly and disruptive. So if you can avoid that, uh, uh, that's a big deal. So, the, and actually, that's one of the main uh, uh, use cases that are now being implemented that people are pursuing is to reduce uh, uh, unplanned downtime and and things like predictive maintenance. And and to your point, uh, so th the first thing is that you want to be able to predict the downtime. So that's a big achievement on its own because it implies that you are collecting the right data that you are that you are uh, uh, training the right machine learning models. So that's a big endeavor by itself. Now, the next step, like you mentioned, is automating a response, uh, having an, uh, an autonomous uh, action in response of, so, so this machine is uh, as a 80% probability that is gonna fail in the, in the next uh, 24 hours. So that's the insight. Now, what is the, the responding action? Uh, do I do I schedule maintenance? Uh, do I send a text to Bob uh, 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 alerting him or, uh, that this is going to happen? So that's where the, the, the levels of sophistication vary. But just knowing that the machine has an 80% of probability of failing within the next 24 hours is gold for many. Yeah, for sure. And not only that, but what I've found um, out there is that uh, there's another benefit in, in the sense that rather than scheduling maintenance for regular intervals, which are very wasteful, now you can actually utilize a component to its uh, full life cycle. Correct. Correct. Uh, uh, which is the, 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 the different appro uh, approaches to maintenance. I mean, there is the, the, the reactive maintenance where you fix things where they break. There is the uh, preventative maintenance, which is the one that you schedule in uh, regular intervals. Uh, the, the benefit is that hopefully things don't break, but the, the downside is that you may be fixing them too early, right? And then there is like the sweet spot, which is the predictive maintenance, where you maximize the life of the part or product or device, uh, but at the same time, you reduce on plan downtime, so which is kind of the sweet spot uh, uh, enabled by by predictive analytics. Now, in terms of the manufacturing customers that you've worked with, what is the typical sweet spot in terms of size or locations? 
I don't think there is a sweet spot. I, I, I think the smart manufacturing is for everybody. I mean, everybody who cares about increasing their, their efficiency, right? Which is everybody. Everybody. So, exactly. so the, the, there is a, a misconception or, 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 or probably the wrong perception that smart manufacturing is only for the, for the most advanced companies in the planet or the biggest or the most resourceful. I say no. I mean, even, even a small uh, uh, machine shop in, in, the, in the U.S. Midwest can benefit of uh, smart manufacturing. Uh, uh, it will benefit. I mean, it's, it's all about using data to, to make better decisions. So, I mean, of course, the, the level of sophistication, the, the use of machine learning or robotics or, or uh, autonomy will be different, but everybody can benefit of making their manufacturing operations smarter and more data-driven. And that's, and that's a really great point right there that this is not something that is uh, unique to large enterprises, but this is something that's redefining, or like you said, re revolutionizing the industry. Right, right. Great. Diego, by now, every industry is developing countless use cases for what's rapidly becoming the ubiquitous blockchain. What are you seeing in manufacturing? Yeah, I mean, I think that despite the hype uh, around blockchain, um, as any new technology, there is a lot of hype and noise. I believe there are some legitimate applications of blockchain for manufacturing. So some applications that are gathering interest uh, because they, they, they are easy to understand the value is a, a, it's a, a handful of them. Uh, one, supply chain management. So recording the transactions throughout the supply chain and enforcing contracts. So this is particularly interesting uh, when blockchain is tied to the IoT. Uh, uh, the best way to explain this is with an example. Uh, say, say you manufacture a, some temperature sensitive product like a drug or a composite material or, or ice cream <laughs> that, that needs to be under say 25 degrees Celsius, right? So you can have temperature sensors connected to the product that monitor the temperature at all times in the, in the supply chain. So if the temperature, say, exceeds this 25 degrees Celsius, some action gets... Actually, in. Fahrenheit. You don't want ice cream at 25 Celsius. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> correct. <laughs> so some action gets triggered depending on where the product is in the supply chain. So for example, it could trigger an alert to a receiving dock to reject the shipment mm -hmm. or uh, it could trigger a financial transaction to, to issue a refund or, or a penalty. So th that those are the supply chain management right now seems to be the, the area gathering the most interest. The other one is a uh, material and product tracking, uh, basically to record where a material or product comes from and has been. So this is useful to, to ensure provenance, uh, for example, to avoid conflict materials, uh, for example, or to prevent counterfeiting, uh, for example, to ensure the, the legitimacy of, of a spare part, particularly important in, in aerospace and, and automotive, right? And uh, the other one uh, that is, is very interesting, the other application of blockchain is to ensure the authenticity of digital files. So this is particularly important in manufacturing because of the emergency of uh, emergence of 3D printing and, and digital manufacturing in general, where you need to ensure that the, the design file that you're using to 3D print this part is legitimate. It is not pirated or, is there, or it comes from the, a reputable source. So those are the, the, three, the three legitimate use of uh, blockchains. That I, that I think are going to start emerging with real applications built on it. Great. And I can't wait till my local grocery store starts implementing blockchain because I can't tell you how many times we get ice cream in this summer and it's all congealed. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, Diego, let's talk about 3D printing. Um, you know, in a recent article by Forbes, they stated that 93% of companies using 3D printing in 2018 are able to gain a competitive advantage, including reducing time to market and flexing to support shorter production runs for their customers. 
In what ways are you seeing 3D printing make an impact in manufacturing? I always say that, that 3D printing is, is an additional tool in the manufacturer's toolkit. So it's a, it's a game changing one, that don't get me wrong, uh, but it, it is wrong to see 3D printing as replacing existing manufacturing, uh, manufacturing methods such as milling or injection molding or casting, right? Just because you could, you could uh, do something with 3D printing doesn't necessarily mean you should, right? So. Having said that, I think that 3D printing's sweet spot is in the fabrication of parts that are geometrically complex, they are highly customized, and they, they are in low production runs. So, 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 so that kind of precludes uh, high volumes, mass, mass production, really, at, at least for the moment. Uh, but, but if you have that combination of geomet geometrically complex highly customized and low production, 3D printing is, is very strong for that. Yeah, and it's a game changer because that allows the little guys to compete with the big Chinese manufacturers that are high volume. Right, right. And, and the, I mean, of course, the, the, uh, it enables a, a, a much more distributed uh, uh, manufacturing because you're just sending, you, you're just sending uh, uh, bits and bytes around, right, uh, uh, on cyberspace, uh, and uh, and things get printed wherever you you want. I mean, I'm I'm oversimplifying it, of course. I mean, uh, uh, 3D printing is 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 uh, is harder than it sounds. Uh, you still need some solid uh, quality control, and there are some post fabrication steps. It's, it's not just like printing a document, at least not yet. But but it has enabled it. It's, it has actually uh, uh, enabled in the, the design of parts that, that are, are more efficient than requires less part. So for example, for part number of part reductions, I mean, we see examples all the time of, of this part had uh, 12 different parts and with 3D printing it's only one. So th that's very significant, uh, uh, the reduction in part number uh, that 3D printing can bring. Now, are there any uh, specific use cases that you've seen that uh, was noteworthy? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the early uh, real applications of 3D printing was, was on entooling. So not producing the final part, but producing the tools that are using, uh, used to secure the part during production, like the, the jigs and the tools. And, and that was a, a very interesting because, because the, the previously you, you had to send the designs uh, most likely to China to get them made and, and then they will come back, they will be very costly uh, uh, just to be able to, to attach your part uh, during production or to fix it in, in your conveyor. But now increasingly manufacturers are 3D printing those things. So it's much more flexible uh, faster. I mean, they don't have to wait for the turnaround and, and cheaper. Yeah, that's definitely going to be a game changer. So talking about game changers, not to get into politics or anything, but uh, we're currently in the midst of a pretty intense trade war uh, negotiations, right? right. Uh, how can smart manufacturing help U.S. companies with their competitiveness in the global marketplace? Okay, so let me, let me approach the question from, from the perspective of a U.S. manufacturer that consumes some material, material or product for which the tariffs have increased, right? So example, the, uh, using the steel example uh, that is, is, is very prominent in this, uh, in this debate, from the perspective of the manufacturer that uses steel uh, as opposed to the one who produces steel, who you can argue benefits from the tariffs. But from the, from the, person, for, from the manufacturer that uses steel as a raw, raw material, so, so the government imposes new tariffs on something that you're importing, right, and you use. That means that your production cost goes up immediately, right? So you have two options. You pass the additional cost to your customers. Uh, uh, you may lose customers in the process. Or two, you absorb it. You absorb the, the cost. And, and, uh, uh, and very neither is a good solution. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Not, yeah. Uh, 
uh, and I'm being very basic, so bear with me. So in the absorb part, when you're absorbing the cost, here you also have two options. You do nothing, so you, your net costs go up and your margin goes down, so you make less money, make less profit, or you become more efficient. Uh, and, and smart manufacturing is one good way to do this, right? So you offset the cost increase and you may even gain customers because your, uh, 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 your shipping time, uh, your production time is lower. I mean, you could get some additional benefits out of them. So it's, uh, I mean, ideally you wouldn't get slapped with tariffs. That's the ideal thing, but the reality is that you probably will. And uh, so you, you have to think about, okay, how do I become more efficient? Uh, uh, how do I reduce my costs uh, and increase my outputs? And, and one way to do that is implementing smart manufacturing uh, initiatives. And that's a good thing. Even if there aren't tariffs, you still want to reduce your expenses and make more right. money. It's a forcing fa function and it's, uh, it's unfortunate for some, but it's, it's not bad. Yeah, exactly. So Diego, with the U.S. unemployment rate down from a high of 10% in October 2009 to an all-time low of 3.9%, you think that it would be a cause for celebration. However, according to websites such as WillRobotTakeMyJob.com, if you're working in manufacturing as a team assembler, there's a 97% certainty that robots will take your job away. Is this just hype? Should we be concerned? Or maybe there's another path we can follow? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not hype, right? I, I think it's important that, uh, that we as a society try to anticipate and, and understand the, the changes that technology brings to our lives and, and more specifically to, to our jobs, right? But the risk is to fall into this false perception that by talking about it, we, we can prevent it. We're, we're, we're not preventing uh, uh, automation or smart manufacturing, it's happening. So, so the conversation should focus instead on how we, we adapt, right? So humanity has been remarkably adaptable to, to changes in, in technology. I mean, particularly because more often than not, in, in balance, they, they do improve our lives and our jobs. So take, take the three previous industrial revolutions. In, in the first industrial revolution, we moved from muscle power to, to steam power, right? In the second industrial revolution, we moved from steam power to electrical power and we introduced mass production. And in the third industrial revolution, we, we added computers and, and automation. So I, I think that, that it's safe to say that no one today looking back will prefer that these shifts uh, never had happened, right? So, so in, in my, if my job is to pick 10 different components and assemble them in some order all day, all week, I, I think I will want my job to be done by a robot. Provided, of course, that I don't become unemployed in the process. And, and that's the kicker, right? So, so as a society, I mean, what do we do, right? So one is don't fight automation. AI and machine learning, it's pretty much pointless. We should understand it, embrace it, and understand that this is not a problem of elimination of jobs, it's a problem of shifting jobs. And a, a focus on reskilling, retraining existing workers, on building an, an educational system that is more agile and adaptable to changes, uh, because change is only going to come faster and faster. So. So, so I think that, that just embrace it, understand it, try to be humane and, uh, about it, right? It's not all about money, uh, but, but instead of trying to prevent it or, or be scared about it, it's okay, uh, how do we shift, right? I mean, the challenge is that unlike 100 years ago, these changes are coming faster and faster and, and society is, doesn't have the time to catch up. So we are seeing we're seeing the, these scenarios where, where uh, unemployment is low, but people are not finding jobs. So it, it's, not, it's not that the jobs are not there. The jobs are there. It's just that the skills, uh, 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 they don't match. So uh, jobs, 
haven't been really eliminated. It's, they just changed to a point where people cannot do them anymore. For sure. And, you know, like you said, I think the, the situation right now is that technology is changing at such a rapid pace. I mean, look what we've got today. We have self-driving cars that are out there for real uh, on the streets of California and Arizona and other places in the United States. We have passenger drones in certain parts of the world, uh, you know, flying drones that are transporting people. We have companies like Tesla working on the Hyperloop. And I think it's happened so quickly in such a short span of time that people are turning around going, oh my gosh, how do we adapt? Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's a two-part um, a, a two-part solution where uh, employers as well as employees need to work together. Companies should look in, inwards to train their uh, employees on exactly. new skills, and then employees should be teachable. They should be willing, like you said, to ad adapt, embrace the technology, and adapt to the new technology and learn new skills. Right, right, right. And, 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 uh, Overcome, I mean, all that is exactly right. And I will add that overcome the, this idea that, that in order to, to do anything in, a, in an automated plant or in, or in a smart plant or anything, that you need a, a degree in computer science. That, that is not true, right? Or a degree on robotics, right? There will still be room for, for less skilled uh, uh, workers who will probably be working side, side to side with a robot. And they, need to, they do need to, to, uh, uh, to learn new skills. They need probably to program the robot. But, but th there will be, I think, they in my maintaining opinion, the robots and maintaining the them. robot. I mean, the, the, no, it's not that all of a sudden we, the only ones in a factory floor will have to be PhDs. And that's not the case, right? It's going to change. The, uh, I think that it goes more to the the basic skills, uh, problem solving skills. I mean, in the past, if a machine stopped working, uh, you will, uh, some experienced person will go to the machine and look at it and see that something is wrong and probably grab a mallet and bang on it and fix it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now things are different. It's probably a, 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 a machine a code a, a instruction that is missing. So instead of a physical, uh, uh, skills, you probably need uh, uh, debugging skills, right? Uh, so the skills change, the problem, so the basic problem solve solving abilities change, but, but it's not that it's going to be exclusive for those who, who have a higher education, which is probably what many people fear. So Diego, uh, what do you think is going to be the next disruptor in manufacturing? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's hard to tell. And uh, 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 it's easy to make predictions, uh, particularly about the future, right? Uh, uh, I said, but I say that it's pretty clear that it's, it's going to be something related to AI and machine learning, right? I, I think I don't want to call it like the, the next disruptor, but definitely a, a disruptor will be a generative design. So generative design is, is the ability to have a AI uh, algorithms design a part or a product based on what we tell the computer we want. So, so we, 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 we specify as designers, instead of defining the geometry or this is going to be uh, this shape, a cylinder with a hole in the middle, the, this length, instead of doing that low level design, we will tell the algorithm, I want a part that withstands these stresses and it needs to fit into this envelope. And then there is an AI algorithm that will uh, create the part uh, for you based on, on the requirements, manufacturability uh, considerations, et cetera. So, and, and, not, and not only will consider a handful of design alternatives, it will consider millions of alternatives to come up with the best design. So, so the more that AI, I mean, right now there are some already commercially available applications that do this, uh, uh, generative design and, and topology optimization, but 
they are by and large they are brute force approach they they just use immense computing power to to generate thousands of options and they analyze them all uh, but increasingly they are adding more and more smarts into it and machine learning and ai so similarly to this adaptive or generative design is adaptive automation and uh, we were we, we mentioned it in passing a few minutes ago, is the ability of factory floor equipment, uh, robots, conveyors, milling machines, material handling systems to, to adapt to disruptions. So you basically tell them, we have to produce 10 engines and they figure out how, right? And they respond to disruptions, a, 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 a cutting tool breaking or a, 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 a conveyor stopping and they adapt because my goal is to produce 10 engines, right? Without human intervention. So that's, uh, that's increasingly coming in very modest uh, uh, applications. Like uh, one is, uh, hey, I'm about to break. Let me schedule my own maintenance. Uh, that's already being done. So those are the uh, first implementations of the more generalized uh, uh, adaptive automation concept. That is so exciting. It's almost like science fiction, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So we're living in really exciting times. I think so. Great. So Diego, our audience is very excited to uh, have you on board and, and have you share um, your wisdom and your experiences with them. And we actually have several questions from our audience. Okay. Let's, uh, let's, let's go with them. All right, so our first question is from Jonathan Goga. He's a recruitment consultant at Alto in Cheltenham, UK. And he says, the IoT industry is expected to experience huge growth over the next decade. And consequently, finding enough people with industrial IoT experience to develop, deploy, and support connected devices within smart factories will become more difficult where there already aren't enough qualified people to meet the demand. What do you suggest can be done about this? And what is Microsoft doing to close the skills gap and upskill existing talent? So you're exactly right, uh, Jonathan. I mean, finding people with IoT skills and, and AI, machine learning, 3D printing, for that matter, is a problem that is already impacting some manufacturer's ability to, to remain competitive. And, uh, and you touched it, uh, 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 Abraham, uh, uh, a couple of minutes ago, that it takes a multi-pronged approach to, to the solution, right? In short term, uh, you may need the skills right away. So don't expect that skilled people will fall onto your lap, right, from schools or from... So take care of your existing workforce and, and create or, or implement your own reskilling or retraining programs. You may reach out to organizations such as the Manufacturing Extension Partnership of, or the DMDII or schools, uh, community colleges, universities for train the trainer type of programs or professional training resources. So that's to take care of your existing workforce, right? Which is, by the way, is, is, is a big majority of the workers out there is the existing workers. Now, long term, uh, participate in the definition of uh, curricula to make sure that they're training your future workers in the skills that you will need, right? And I will add, uh, again, without the intent of getting political, uh, uh, lobby for, for smart immigration policies that help fill the skill gap with people from anywhere in the world. Our next question is from Richard Gold, a promising product manager in the fintech scene in London, UK. Richard says, I've noticed that very large and established companies are moving onto a cloud-based system and away from legacy, I assume. What are the implications for the end customer? Perhaps companies are moving their services primarily due to business motivations. Right. It's always due to business motivations. So, so the, the, uh, Richard, the, the cloud offers uh, two main advantages to, to the end user. And, and I'm, I'm going to specify to the end user of manufacturing software applications, obviously, we are, if we're talking about the cloud, it is, it's because you're using a software application. So the, the advantages are there is 
you don't need to worry about IT infrastructure uh, anymore or as much. Uh, you are basically outsourcing your IT infrastructure to a cloud vendor. So the cloud vendor takes care of the computers, the networking, the cables, the building, the software updates, stuff that you don't need to do anymore. Okay, so that's a big one. And that's not only for large and established companies, actually. It's, you can make the case that small and struggling companies need this more than anybody because they don't have the IT resources. So the, the second advantage is that with cloud-based solutions, is, is easier to, to pay for what you use. So it's easier to add and remove users, comp add or remove compute power, storage, number of device connected. So the solutions tend to be more flexible and scalable. And lastly, uh, security. I mean, uh, most companies cannot match the security of a cloud vendor that invests millions of dollars in security and has uh, its reputation, frankly, uh, at stake if a security breach uh, occurs. So, so the security that someone like Microsoft can implement both cyber security and physical security is very hard to match. So that's why companies, not only big, but also small, are increasingly uh, going to, to cloud-based uh, uh, solutions. And, and, and we saw that in, in manufacturing specifically, it started with the supporting applications, HR, finances, uh, they were moving their, 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 their functions to cloud-based solutions, uh, a CRM, uh, uh, things like that. But increasingly, that's happening in more uh, critical manufacturing systems, like uh, production, quality, supply chain management. Our next question is from Bennett Bayer. He's the former global CMO at Huawei and longtime Microsoft distributor and channel champion in Seattle, Washington. And Bennett says, as more VARs become MSPs, what does the Microsoft cloud-first strategy mean for the enterprise channel partner who don't want to lead with selling Microsoft Cloud, but rather sell their own solutions? Mm -hmm. Bennett, we, we rely on partners uh, uh, to deliver industry-specific solutions. I mean, we closely partner with, with software vendors and systems integrators to, to go to market, to sell together, to, to market together. So we actively promote them and help them in any way we can uh, for them to be successful. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, all we care as a platform vendor is that their solution, uh, uh, quote, spins the, the Azure meters. Right? So whether they, they do it directly on Azure or through their solutions, uh, we, we love them the same. Great. And as a follow-up question from Bennett, what keeps you awake at night? Yeah, I assume it's uh, professionally, right? <laughs> so uh, so I, I say that... Uh, uh, when, when our customers and, and partners uh, uh, build their solutions on top of our cloud platform, they are take, taking a pretty big dependency on us. Uh, so we, the, uh, if we fail, they'll fail. So we have to deliver the, the performance, the reliability, and the security that they, they need. I mean, otherwise, they get impacted, we get impacted. So we have a big responsibility on their success and, and we cannot let them now down. Our next question is from Mark Dressner. He's a business owner at Office Evolution in Hackensack, New Jersey. At what point will smart technology and manufacturing enable U.S. manufacturers to compete from a cost perspective with factories in countries like China? The main factor that, that made China so attractive uh, a decade or so ago from the point of view of cost was labor cost, right? Many companies made footprint decisions or, or, or outsourcing decisions largely based on, on, on the fact that the labor cost was so uh, uh, much cheaper uh, uh, compared to, to higher wages countries like the U.S. But... This labor cost uh, gap is closing. So, so I mean, Chinese uh, workers and 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 uh, 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 population is is getting richer, and they are joining the consumer 
uh, population. So labor cost is becoming less of a factor. So, so once you remove, remove labor cost uh, out of the equation, smart manufacturing becomes more of a factor because as you make your manufacturing operations more efficient, uh, meaning that you reduce the costs and or increase the output, that makes you more competitive, right? So uh, one related story uh, that related to the closing labor cost gap is that automation uh, has actually created jobs in higher wage countries like the US. And it seems a little bit counterintuitive, but, but if you think about it, the higher wave, uh, wage countries like the US may be bringing some of their operations back to the country uh, because labor cost is not much of an issue. But the difference is that, that they mix it up with automation. So granted, they, they, they may not create the same numbers of jobs as it was in China, for example, but they do create jobs that were not here before, uh, thanks to automation. They wouldn't do it without automation. So you'll see as the, as the, as the wages increases, there is more and more a case for automation. And that's not necessarily bad because that can enable some companies to either uh, uh, open new factories in, in other places, uh, expand their operations. It's not a zero sum game. And, you know, I'm so glad that you're here to talk about these things because I know that a lot of people are concerned about their futures and, and what's going to be with their jobs and their incomes. And that was such an amazing point that you made, how automation is actually creating new jobs and is, is also closing that, that wage gap between right. the U.S. and China. Right. right. And, and something to keep in mind re, re, regarding to jobs, right? It's pretty much established that we'll never go back to the to the levels of jobs that were were in the 70s. So uh, uh, manufacturing, direct manufacturing jobs, uh, automation and, and technology uh, is preventing that. We don't need as many people, right? Having said that, it, it, the 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 definition of what a manufacturing job is has 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 increased in scope a lot. So uh, uh, true, there are less people directly on the factory floor assembling parts or cutting metal, but there are much more manufacturing related, particularly in services uh, that, that, that is growing exponentially. So, so sometimes when they say, oh, the, there are, the number of manufacturing jobs are decreasing, you should take that with a grain of salt, right? It's, it's, and understand, okay, what do you define by, uh, what do you mean by a manufacturing work, a job? Our next question is from Ken Heron. He's the chief marketing officer of intelligent IoT messaging company, Unified Inbox in Orlando, Florida. Ken says, hi, Diego. Hi, Ken. Here's my question. Manufacturing is complex and expensive. Any change is by definition disruptive. What do you view as the low-hanging fruit for companies? So, to me, the, the low-hanging fruit, if you will, is, is just to, to make an attempt to, to extract insight out, out of all this data that, that you are collecting. Right? To, to visualize IoT data in some meaningful way that is going to give you some sort of insight. Uh, a, a dashboard with KPIs is, is a great start, right? That alone can, can surface insights that, that were hidden before. So don't try to, to run before you walk, basically. Don't, don't think that you have to go straight into automation or machine learning, right? Sometimes just being able to calculate a KPI based on, on real live data is a lot. So th there are also, uh, uh, related to that, uh, many people say, okay, I cannot, my machine is, my, my, my equipment is old. I cannot even connect. I mean, they, they don't generate any data. Well, there are some low cost and non-intrusive uh, sensors in the market that enable you to connect uh, legacy equipment to the IoT and start sensing data like temperature, energy consumption, vibration. I mean, sometimes you don't need a lot. I mean, there are, I've seen companies that just uh, uh, sensing energy consumption out of their machines, they've achieved uh, improvements 
in, in uh, energy optimization, machine utilization, just by knowing that this machine is consuming energy. So it, it's not the amount of data. So, uh, uh, however, as I mentioned before, don't just start collecting data willy-nilly, right? Start with a business goal you want to achieve and then work backwards to the sensor data that you need to support it. Diego, for our developers out there, uh, are there any uh, toolkits or any, are there any Microsoft products that uh, people can try? Uh, sure. I mean, let me scope it down to IoT products. Uh, I mean, of course, you have our cloud platform. So if you're an, a developer, uh, uh, you can go to town with it. Uh, you, you can develop all sorts of applications, but specifically IoT applications, I, I would say, uh, uh, go to our, uh, um, you can just uh, uh, search for Azure IoT and uh, learn about our IoT services, things like the IoT Hub, uh, uh, the Time Series uh, Insight, but that we also have uh, like uh, pre-configured solutions or, or starting points that, that are solutions that are running solutions and they can still they can see how they work and they start looking into it and, and see how they were developed. And we also have a, a, a SaaS solution, a, a solution as a service IoT solution called IoT Central uh, that you can also get your hands uh, uh, dirty uh, uh, and understand what we do on IoT. So Diego, how do people connect with you? So uh, uh, the the best way is uh, if you if you follow me on on Twitter, uh, and my my Twitter handle is uh, uh, at Diego Tamburini, my first name and last name. Uh, you can also follow me on LinkedIn, uh, Diego Tamburini, and uh, I that's a big part of my job uh, connecting with the community. So please engage with me, respond to my tweets, ask me questions there. I follow that very closely. Great. And I'm going to post that in the show notes so people can just click right on that and uh, get to you. Okay. Diego, do you have any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share with the audience? Mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't call them words of wisdom, but uh, 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 random observations. How's that? Uh, uh, <laughs> one is uh, there, there is a lot of excitement around smart manufacturing industry 4.0, automation, machine learning. There is a lot of hype, of course, and it may be overwhelming to some who may be asking themselves, uh, where do I start? Is this for me? Can I afford it? So my advice is to take a step back and look at the problems you want to solve. Do I want to increase productivity? Do I want to improve quality? Uh, do I want to create a new source of revenue? So start with the business problem in mind and then focus on solving that problem at a very small scale. So don't attempt to do manuf smart manufacturing in a big bang uh, uh, fashion. Increase the machine utilization of, of one machine or implement uh, predictive maintenance for one product. Start small, uh, fail fast and, and move on, right? So and prove the value and then rinse and repeat, right? And, and grow and grow and grow. So uh, the, finally, I will, I will say that I mentioned before, don't, don't collect data for the sake of collecting data. Uh, uh, that will only result on, on uh, frustration and on the belief that IoT has no value. So uh, I like to say the, the, the following, uh, collecting data without analyzing it is hoarding. Analyzing the data without a resulting action is admiring the problem. And taking actions without a business goal in mind is wishful thinking. So always start with a business problem in mind and work it back to the data that you need to, to collect to support that business problem. I love that. Diego, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. I really enjoyed having you on the show. I enjoyed this very much. Thank you, Abraham. And to your listeners for, for the time uh, listening to this edition. 